Welcome to Eggs the Podcast, featuring the best and brightest minds in business leadership, entrepreneurship, and technology. Today, we have special guest Isaac Hetzron, founder of Imprint Genius, a sourcing company that was named the number one fastest growing custom merch distributor of the entire industry in 2020. Isaac's lifelong passion for manufacturing and global sourcing has taken him on a journey around the world. From tea in Sri Lanka to jewelry in Thailand, his knowledge and experience have helped businesses source outside of just China and have helped grow economies that just need a bit more visibility to break into the world. In this episode, we'll dive into Isaac's journey and learn about his global guide and lessons for sourcing products. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Isaac Katsrani. Hey, Isaac, how are you, man? Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thrilled to have you. Appreciate it. Why don't you give us a little uh, quick background on who you are and how you got into what you do? Yeah, for sure. So I'm Isaac Itzeroni. Uh Again, I run Imprint Genius. Uh, I also run a blog called The Sourcing Guy, uh, where I teach people about product sourcing, uh, how I got into the whole kind of space. I started my company in my freshman dorm room. Uh, it was about seven years ago. So it's been a definitely interesting journey getting here. And uh, I kind of grew up within product sourcing and manufacturing. Both, some, both sides of my family owned factories. On my mom's side, we had a small apparel factory in Toronto. And my dad's side, uh, he owns an electronics factory in China. So ever since I was a little kid, always, you know, being in the industry really helped me, you know, gain a, a passion for manufacturing, uh, gave me a really strong understanding about global supply chain and production and allowed me to have a really strong base and, you know, look at product sourcing from a slightly different lens. Love it. Yeah, no, I think I think that's great. Well, and, and I mean, obviously, it's a leg up to have sort of entrepreneurial uh, parents, you know, or have folks that are in this industry. And so and not everybody has that. So like, but also, I think there's the this thing that can happen where your parents do a thing, you get exposed to this thing. And so you just want nothing to do with it. So what was your experience like growing up with parents that were both doing this sort of thing? And, you know, how did you find that it sort of fit for you? Yeah, well, I think that my parents were always very supportive of, you know, for me, like to be an entrepreneur and any, from a young age, you know, I would always have these different companies through middle school, high school, probably had four or five different businesses. And I, I well, I, in, I realized that I didn't love what my dad was manufacturing, right? He was manufacturing complex electronics. Um, it seemed, you know, not something I want, I didn't want to go because that's the original plan, right? Like, okay, dad's going to pass down the factory to me. I'm going to go move to China and run a factory. That's not what I wanted to do. But I realized I, I really loved, you know, seeing products being created. I loved being that middleman uh, managing production. I loved e-commerce as well. And I decided why not, you know, instead of just fighting against like the family, um, using what I've learned, you know, since I was a little kid and building something for myself. Can you tell us about the first iteration, how uh, you started it in your dorm room? I mean, what products were you selling? How did you get, how did you acquire those products and uh, how did you sell them? Yeah, for sure. So ever since like middle school, I was always just flipping different gadgets I would find uh, or products, whether it was, you know, fake Beats by Dre headphones or hats or G-Shocks. I would go find factories in China, fill up a backpack and sell them through the middle school. Um, but then when I, when I came to college, um, I was kind of past that little phase of my life where I thought it was. And I brought this little cell phone fan that plugs into your phone, uh, out to a party. Cause I was in Gainesville, Florida, it's super hot during the summertime. And, um, all these people surrounded me they're like, Oh my God, where'd you get that? That's such a cool product. And I was just showing people like the AliExpress link where you can just order one. Right. And eventually I was like, okay, screw it. I'm yeah, I sell them, you know, and I started telling people that I sold the product and I had a little business and I kind of made up on the spot. I ordered the hundred and I started bringing them to parties and just kind of selling them because there was such a big need with uh, rush coming up for sororities. Um, and then started like picking up steam and I built um, like long story short, in a few months, built a massive company uh, selling these cell phone fans. And we were bringing in, you know, thousands, thousands of them uh, selling different campuses uh, doing bulk, doing e-commerce. And a bunch of people thought I invented the cell phone fan and I was really just importing this little gadget. Uh, just people hadn't seen it yet. Then we started making, again, requests for custom ones and people started using it as a promotional product. And then I started essentially a promotional products company all focused on unique direct sourced promotional products that weren't in the in the industry. So 
you know, you could go to your regular promo company for your basic stuff, but you want something really cool, you come to us. And that was kind of like how I started in the space. Um, and then was able to use this foundation of direct sourcing and use, uh, you know, the lack of understanding of the industry and going into the industry without having that, like, this is how it's supposed to be done. I was able to build a very unique kind of business within our space and continually try to, you know, push the barrier and innovate in in a space that has, you know, 20,000 promotional box distributors. Yeah, no, it's really an interesting space, you know, like as a a design agency, like we obviously design a lot of things that end up becoming promotional products for different clients. And Mm -hmm. I've noticed over the last few years, you know, the problems have becoming or have been becoming even more and more challenging this, this idea of how do we find a thing that's unique or exclusive, right? Because everybody's done a stress ball, everybody's done a cool pen, you know, all that stuff. Sorry, I have a fly attacking me right now. Um, so I I mean, so we're doing, you know, all these kind of standard products, right. And then I have these clients come to me and they're like, oh, well, we want something new or interesting. And you go to these, you know, I guess sort of run of the mill suppliers or the traditional suppliers. And, you know, I don't know. I I mean, now it's a a Yeti instead of a, you know, like a a drink cup instead of, you know, some other kind of brand of tumbler or something like, I mean, things have iterated and gotten better, but they're not like leaps and bounds better. So I think it's a, a really cool narrow niche that you discovered this idea of, of trying to find the coolest or the best things. How have you noticed or have you seen people adopting these kinds of ideas? Because it seems like there's a demand for it. People are looking for these new interesting items. But I mean, are you having any trouble getting people to kind of, I guess, come over to this way of doing business? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we're we try to innovate a lot of different ways within the industry. And it's obviously it's difficult, like explain that there's better ways to do um X, Y, and Z within merchandising, especially people have been doing it for, they've been head of marketing at whatever company for 20 years and they've been doing the swag a certain way. But I think as, you know, more of the younger generation is coming in and they're expecting uh, more choice, faster turnarounds a lot of times, uh, better like overall buying experience, distribution experience, and more retail grade product. Um, the, you know, the, buy, the buyers are changing and we're getting more and more requests for, you know, just more unique product that really stands out that feels more like a brand. Uh, You know, a great example is if you look at like any fast food chain, you know, they're all coming out with high end retail grade, like merch lines. And it's so, you know, Taco Bell isn't launching stress balls or handing out stress balls anymore. They're making like full jumpsuits, right. That are actually cool. And I I think that's uh, moving the whole industry. The whole industry is moving in that direction. I don't know if I'd be caught dead wearing a jumpsuit by Taco Bell. And... <laughs> <laughs> no so offense, negative, Mike. you know what You're I mean. So negative, Mike. It could be your, it could be your look. You just don't even know. Trust um, me, Mike. Me, like, but look up the Taco Bell new merch line, guys, and you will be very surprised by how well you know a lot of these brands are designing their their. I mean, it looks like something out of a like a, a cool streetwear store. Yeah, That's it's cool. funny. Like, I, I don't know that particular one, the the jumpsuit, but I mean, like you've seen like the Travis Scott collaborations with McDonald's and stuff like that, where they roll out all this Cactus Jack gear. And, you know, I mean, it, it's clear that they're making a move that way. And I think one of the things that's happening is I think the old days of like sort of the stress ball on the pen and stuff like that, the concept was, hey, let's just get something almost like a business card kind of model, right? Like, let's get a thing in somebody's hand. And that's that. Like, you know, maybe they'll call us, maybe they'll think of us, maybe they'll leave it on their desk. But if they throw away, like you know, no harm. Like, you know, it was just kind of a cheap little giveaway, you know, but there wasn't this value put on people. And now it seems like there's a a leveling up. And I think we saw a lot of this during the pandemic, especially like with these swag packages, especially for like new hires or, you know, new business and things like that, where you were putting together these packages that are really nice, actually, you know, and, uh, you know, like I got one from a a client kind of recently that had a, I'm not sure how to say it. I think it's a, a Pura or a Pura something it's a, a plug-in like air freshener thing that plugs into the wall you put mm-hmm. little cartridges in it and it's wi-fi enabled and all this stuff it came with that and one of these stanley tumblers you know I mean, it's a nice little thing you know i mean like to go buy it at retail you know it's probably 40 bucks or something you know but it but they're not sending them to everybody right like so we're it's not the same model where it was like give it to every person who passes our table instead it's hey let's identify a few key people and let's send them this thing 
And so would you say that, you know, as far as like sort of gift giving and that sort of stuff goes, I mean, is that the trend? I mean, are people moving to maybe a little nicer, a little uh, more high quality thing to stand out, but maybe identifying their customer a little more, putting a little more work into knowing who they're giving it to? A hundred percent. And that comes with um, there being a lot more automation within the space. So the, the problem with doing this in the past is it, it's very complicated to create, you know, a lot of small batch merchandise and then assemble that merchandise and then distribute that to the the right people and filter who gets what right but nowadays you know so we we have a kind of automated swag solution and what that looks like is you know we're fully integrated with like salesforce hubspot workday and we're able to pull all the different data from that and when um, a deal moves from one stage to another stage, depending on the, the type of client it is and the certain tags, it will, can know to auto deploy, you know, a certain swag pack to that person. Mm. Also with that, you, there was also abilities for people to choose their own merchandise. So then uh, you can auto distribute gift cards for like a specific collection and then let people kind of pick from, you know, based on their budget allocations. And then all that ties in right with the CRM. So now you have metrics on, you know, this client was a, or this person was a prospect and we gifted the, uh, we tested half the prospects we send a gift box to, half the prospects we don't give a gift box to. But the the, the series B that we sent gift box to, we saw a, an extra 30%, you know, higher conversion rate for those people that got the gift box. And our cost basis on the gift box was X, Right. So now we have a, you know, we have a ROAS metric. We have a return on ad spend essentially. Um, and now, so you have, now you have trackable metrics on a marketing campaign and a physical merchandise campaign and brands can spend now a lot more on their merchandise because they know they're getting the ROI in the past. It was, yeah, we're going to go give out pens. We're going to give out all these different items and we have no way of knowing how well it's going to do. So on average companies were taking about 10% of their marketing budget, sometimes less. And they're going to say, we're going to buy a bunch of merch. We're going to put it there. We'll see where it goes. Now with a lot of brands having a hard time, you know, interacting with consumers, getting harder and harder in sales process, getting harder and harder to run ads right? And get get that positive ROAS. We're seeing a lot of brands move over to more of a physical marketing approach because they're seeing the positive return on investment. Yeah, no, it's funny how like sort of what's old is new and what's new is old again, right? I mean, like <laughs> just, you know, doing the human version of this, which is, you know, we, we're taking some time to identify who our customer is and we're investing in that customer relationship. I think, you know, it, it's an obvious thing, but I think there was sort of this window of time where we got sort of taken with, um, you know, online advertising and Facebook ads and all this stuff. And not to say they don't still have their place, but I think there was this moment where a lot of marketers were just putting money into those things as a way to be hands off. Like we get good data, we get good, you know, metrics, we get all this stuff that we can look at and share with our clients that make it look like we're doing a lot. And we don't really have to go talk to anybody. We can just kind of do it from the comfort of our desk. And, uh, and I think that that led to a lot of sort of disassociation between companies and brand or uh, brands and, and their customers. And mm-hmm. so it seems like there's been a big push, you know, to try and get a little more human again. And I think, again, I mentioned before, but I think sort of the, the pandemic time period when companies were having to do a lot of their wooing by remote, they weren't able to just, you know, wine and dine people over dinner or whatever, but you were seeing a, a big influx in companies that were sending out these really cool swag boxes and all, all kinds of things. Uh, there was another one I got during during that period where uh, a company I work with sent over a, a little movie projector and a popcorn bucket and all this stuff, you know, so you could have basically a movie night in your backyard. And, uh, yeah. you know, and I mean, but it was really cool, but it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for like sort of this pandemic situation where people felt like they had to try and put in a little extra effort to get personal. And so, uh, so I think that, you know, if anything positive came out of that, it seems like you know, this, this approach of, or this, you know, shifting evolving approach into going back to really one-on-one relationships with customers that you're trying to, to win, I think is, is ultimately going to be better for the consumers, but I think it's also better for the companies. A hundred percent. And it's, it's not actually just corporate gifting or corporate gifting was a huge aspect of it, but it was also uh, internally for employees, right? You had all these employees who were in the office and there's, there's certain culture and energy about being in the office. And now you're moving everyone remote, right? How do you keep that culture alive? How do people have people, you know, who are sitting at home really feel connected to the, to the brand, 
So that's where we saw, you know, a huge growth as well within swag, more, more personalized swag, more swag distribution systems like what we have, right, where you can, employees can go and get single pieces of merchandise created and distributed anywhere in the world, right? Um, so instead of swag being traditionally, right, you make 100 hoodies or whatever it is, you put in the stock room, and then you hand them out for whatever reason. Nowadays, you can't do that, right, with all these the global workforces and people working from home. So all these companies are moving over to these digital platforms to be able to effectively, you know, distribute merchandise and build incentive programs. Like that's what our workday integration is for, right? So when it's someone's birthday, they can automatically get deployed a piece of merchandise and um, it can make, you know, HR easy and try to keep more up high. So uh, I've been listening to the biography on Steve Jobs and his attention to detail and his um, just design aesthetic and ability to just get the coolest, latest, greatest, coolest thing, you know, is, is next to none. And, and, and it's, I'm at the point where he's building the iPod and uh, just the styling components and, and everything that uh, goes into his thought process is really unique. When you're going and, and finding new products, like the the fan or or whatever it is, do you? I mean, are you going to China? Are you looking for stuff like that specifically for a client, or do you say, hey, this would work for a good product for the whole website, and we'll just put it on there, and I have a a link here. Do you actually do custom shopping for specific clients at all? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I so I spent. Last year, I spent about eight months traveling through Asia, building out new supply chains. And like like I mentioned, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, all over the world. Um, and that was a lot for like our e-commerce customers as well. And then I just spent three months, I'm sorry, three weeks at the Canton Fair in China. Uh, Global Sources Fair, Hong Kong Ele- Electronic Show, and then the and then phase two and three of the Canton Fair. So like I am physically on the ground uh, finding new products and doing what we can. But my best, uh, like the way that, find the best products it's not necessarily like discovering like a new gadget necessarily but it's looking at consumer trends within the retail market and then uh, giving that opportunity to move into the promotional products market so a perfect example of that that is one of our biggest categories is athleisure and things like you know high-end uh yoga pants and yoga mats and these kinds of products they're not currently available within the promotional products world and the supplier distributorship world you go to the big promo conferences you're not going to see these kinds of products um but they're very hot and these big companies have these athletic events and they want to have these like more athleisure type products um so us being able to you know we found some great suppliers that can do you know, super high end, like $80 retail kind of yoga pants at 25 piece MOQs, right? So us being able to have that unique value proposition offered out to our customers. Um, and, you know, we're not, again, we're not reinventing a yoga pant or a mat or any of those kinds of products, but we're taking something that's really hot for our generation and, and the market and just moving it over to the corporate space. I like that. Yeah, it makes sense. So you started to talk about it a little bit. And so maybe we should talk about technology in this space, because I think that a big part of the the advancement of, you know, these types of products has come through sort of big moves in technology and and not just like, I, I think I heard you talking about a, on another podcast, I, I was listening to you to prepare for this. You were talking about sort of like a selfie drone or something. So I'm not, not, not just saying only that kind of technology. But um, but also, I mean, a big factor in your success is the ability to do print on demand. And so and, and you've sort of tiptoed around it as we've been talking, but maybe we ought to spend a minute on print on demand and what that sort of, you know, enables you to do. Because I, for people who aren't uh, familiar with it, you know, and, and we've had some people on the on the show, uh, we had the CMO of Printful and some of these other guys that do that kind of work on. But maybe let's talk a little bit about what print print on demand sort of has enabled you to do with your business and how it's really sort of, I guess, poured fuel on your business uh, in terms of a growth strategy. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, first off, I'll, I'll give a little rundown of what print on demand is for people who aren't super, super familiar with it. Print on demand is the technology for us to uh, decorate uh, blank goods um, at one piece. So when an order comes in, 
where um, instead of the, you know, polo being already embroidered, sitting in the warehouse, ready to ship, we're able to um, decorate that polo with whatever logo, you know, whatever size and color that we need, and then ship that to the end customer. And with print on demand within the corporate, so print on demand has been booming, right, within the e-commerce space. But now it's been catching up within the promotional products and, and um, essentially like the uh, corporate merchandising space. So what was happening was, you know, first thing was like direct to garment T-shirts. And so it's like full color imprint T-shirts on like basic, basic tees. And that's, that was great for like people launching stores and launching like basic brands, uh, but not super great for if you're like a, a company and you need to have a lot of merchandise and you want to have more name brands and big product variety, it wasn't really available. And now um, the technology is getting there and the solutions are getting there to be able to do, you know, that embroidered polo or heat transferred hat or all these different products um, at one piece at not that much more expensive than doing it in bulk, especially when we're talking about, you know, pre working with premium brands, like if we're embroidering a Nike polo, you know, and we're making a hundred polos versus one polo, you're not going to see a huge price difference um, in it because a lot of the, the cost basis of it is actually the blank that we're working with. Right. So that that's kind of like the overview, right? So how is this, how does this affect the industry and how does this affect how people produce and distribute merchandise? Well, in the past, you had to make predictions over what people are going to want. So, you know, CMOs and HR directors are going through every, you know, quarter or year and they're going and trying to pick out pretty basic items that they think are going to work for the whole company. They're going to go and put buy those and put a bunch of stock in a warehouse and then people are going to pick from a bunch of boring items and the, the size is going to be off and you know it's uh, the brand might not be cool anymore and the product might be a fidget spinner and that's not cool anymore right so you have all this excess stock and waste um and then you because there's a limited budget there might only be like 10 products on the swag on the online swag store or 20 products right which is not a good buying experience now with on-demand printing and the ability to produce products uh, at one piece, you know, we offer a hundred thousand different products on demand. So you can have a large scale store with all kinds of brands, Nike, North Face, Adidas, Carhartt, et cetera, you know, selfie drones, all these types of products available at one piece, living on the store, mocked up. But then when someone goes and it's their birthday and they get a hundred dollars to the store, that that item that they're purchasing it doesn't it doesn't exist it only is produced once it's ordered and then shipped out and then you can combine this with the benefits of economies of scale so you can still have inventory for some of the top items or the really popular stuff but the selfie drone that you know is a really cool thing to have on the store but only gets ordered a few times a year right that would normally never be on a store but now it has the ability to and it can create a, a more personalized experience and give people the choice of what merchandise they want, which is also a huge issue within the industry. Because when you go to a conference and get a bunch of swag you don't want, you throw it out, right? And that's just the bad for the environment. That's bad for budgets. But if you give people the ability to actually pick a product that they're going to like, just like they're going to buy something on Amazon, they're probably not going to throw it out the next day. Same concept. So um, I'm really excited for how the industry is moving into, you know, a bigger focus on print on demand because I think it's making promotional products higher quality. It's making them more effective and it's overall, uh, it's making things more trackable because it's online and it's uh, reducing waste as a whole. So the, the print on demand space um, back in the day wasn't that good because you would get a, a t-shirt or whatever and it'd be a, instead of a nice screen print, it'd be like the heat stuff and it would come off and it would just be nasty and the ability to have the same kind of margins is you know cost you know maybe a buck or two more for the the one item that's high quality is is next level compared to you know just going and getting the one off that's just a heat iron on kind of logo and it, it, those are just horrible and uh it's nice to have some quality and and have it on the the same day kind of thing so uh props on that appreciate it yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about sort of this experience then. So like it, we talked earlier about how, you know, corporate gifting has evolved, you know, and you mentioned just now conferences. So if I'm going to a conference and I wanted to maybe try and apply some of these new principles, this idea that I'm going to have you get what you want, 
you know, instead of me buying a bunch of inventory, you know, or maybe I buy some cheap pens or whatever for the, you know, to have at the conference booth. But like, have you seen how um, customers, you know, your customers might use, you know, or the, I guess the type of strategies they might use to be able to customize that experience for the person who's stopping by their booth, for example, like, I mean, are they setting up an iPad and letting you shop? You know, what are they doing to, to actually apply this stuff? Exactly. Yeah. So what's really cool about these kinds of solutions is it's not only making this entire process smoother and more effective, it's also giving uh, metrics on how effective that trade show is as a whole. So uh, what, what we see customers do is, you know, they'll still be advertising, they're giving away swag, right? But there might be a certain criteria and they'll have a couple samples of the items that they might give out. Um, but someone might have to fill out, you know, a, a form and qualify or whatever for the swag or enter the win or that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and then once they fill, fill it out or a qualifier or they talk to the right person, then they can go and potentially get, you know, a QR code or a certain code or, or an access link or simply access to the iPad to pick out what they want. Um, now we still say that like that works great. And then maybe you could still have like one basic low, like, you know, cool basic giveaway to drive a, more traffic and volume to the booth and then have these higher end items that are more like with a little bit of a wall. So what this does is now people who are serious about getting the product, right? Now they're they're filling out all this information. Now you're building an entire lead list, right? And then, and then you're getting trackability of, these are all the people that we, all the leads we got, right? Now they're gonna go and buy merchandise. They're gonna get merchandise sent to them. Now we have, more to call them like the sales reps can now call and be like hey man saw you got the golf polo and you met james blah 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 you know you're the golf guy blah blah you know we can go into a whole sales funnel with that and then additionally now you have um in, entered into the crm right your the customer that they and where they came from right so now you have the trackability of like all these customers came from this conference how much you spent on the conference, how much you spent on the merchandise. And then you can take the, all those costs and then you can look at your overall ROI metrics of the entire conference uh, a lot more seamlessly. And that's that's the real beauty of it, right? Before, and and you don't have to bring boxes and boxes with a crap to your, to your event too. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Uh, I like the fact that you can kind of use the getting the product as the excuse to get the data. The, so like the address and the phone number and so on and so forth it's like hey this is going to be coming your way mm -hmm. meanwhile at the same time you're getting them in your pipeline which is great so how does the integration with uh, salesforce go is it pretty seamless or is it do you need a tech guy to set it up for you no it's pretty seamless yeah, no, I think that's awesome. I, I mean, like Mike said, you know, the the ability to get a person sort of in your pipeline almost instantly is really great. And I think it, it can also be sort of an incentive or a reason to talk, right? Like, oh, you know, hey, by the way, here's this card, you know, oh, scan this thing, it's good for 50 bucks, you know, go go buy something, it'll be cool. You know, um, have you noticed with print on demand? So, I mean, we've been using print on demand in one of our businesses for a long time, um, all the way back to what, like Mike was describing with those horrible heat transfers they used to do in the old director garment stuff. But the um, the way they do it now is actually, you know, quite sophisticated. They use, you know, basically what amount to like inkjet printers, but they're using real screen printing ink and things like that. So they, they're much more similar to what you would get in, you know, a, a um, you know, in an environment where you ordered in bulk. And uh, and so the quality is so much better. But one of the, the problems, or at least that we've experienced is sort of lead time on these things. Um, have you seen, you know, just in that you know, instead of having it instantly or, you know, like Amazon shipped in a couple of days, you know, you're looking a couple of weeks or something like that. And so I wonder, you know, are you seeing any trends in print on demand generally, you know, are lead times getting shorter, are products becoming more accessible? You know, what are you seeing as a, as an overall trend? Yeah, I would say that lead times are getting shorter and shorter products are getting more accessible. And there's a couple of reasons why that's happening. So um, when it comes to on demand, the the thing that can create the longest production time has to do with where is the blank coming from? So mm -hmm. when we're running a store and with a hundred thousand different products, right. And all these different options, we can't warehouse all those different goods 
at the same facility as that we're doing decoration. There's just too much skew variety. So when someone orders that Nike Polo, a lot of times it's going to come from a warehouse that might be, you know, and all the all the shipments are grouped together, but it might take a few days for it to be, you know, shipped, pick, picked, shipped, received, staged, right, ready to go. So that can create delays. Um, where we're seeing uh, a shift is, you know, with print on demand, there's a lot of print on demand vendors that can do, you know, 24 hour turns, 48 hour turns, like two or three day turns because they're utilizing their stock. And so the stock is, is a really good way to lower that timing. But now because of the growth of on demand and because there's more automation in space and all this kind of stuff and more technology on the printing side, um, we're seeing like more and more suppliers, you know, hold stock of more promotional product type, you know, the, the polo and these kinds of pieces where you can have uh, available to a client, you know, these items are going to ship in 72 hours, right? But all these other items are going to take about two weeks, right? So you need to get a polo to someone for the conference in, you know, five days or seven days. You got to go with, with this basic one, I'm sorry. Or you should pre-purchase polos with us and we're going to stock those and those are going to be like your your stuff that's going to be instant ship and ready to go. You know, you're not as much in a rush. You have some more time. Great. Then the person can get the exact polo that they're looking for. So do you, so as a client, if I wanted, you know, a hundred shirts in, set aside in storage, ready to go, that's an option. I can yeah, just, so, yeah, go ahead. So, we call it, we call it like a hybrid program, right? So you have your top SKUs and like those those items you want to ship quick and all that kind of stuff, as well as new hire kits and any of that kidding program that you guys were talking about earlier. You you have that stock and you have that blended in with your print on demand, um, so you can have like different collections or different uh, options within your store. Huh, that's yeah, really that's cool. Su- super, yeah, super convenient versus you know keeping it in the stock room or sharing the janitor's closet or something. So I mean that works out pretty good. Um, hey, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, so you mentioned earlier sort of environmental considerations, you know, things that were you, you're saving a lot of waste, you're saving, you know, not just financial waste, but, you know, the number of T-shirts going in the garbage. Um, can you also talk about some of sort of the ethical considerations? So, I mean, a lot of the the products and things that we're buying, uh, you know, that come print on demand, I mean, like everything in, you know, at least everything in this country is made in China. You know, I mean, so we're buying from all these different parts of the world that have different sort of, you know, cultures and, and you know, some things are good and some things are bad. Is there anything that you guys are doing to, you know, I guess, sort of ensure the quality of your products, you know, first and foremost, but also sort of make sure that the these manufacturers or these suppliers are working ethically? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest things is, you know, me or people from my team physically flying out and meeting and seeing the factories of, you know, almost everyone that we work with. That That's a big piece. Uh, working with established factories and have it that have, you know, BSEI reports and all different, uh, you know, third party audited reports uh, based off of, you know, sustainability, as well as workers rights and conditions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you know what to look for, you know how to kind of spot the bad apples. It, it's not very hard to, uh, but you have to really know what you're looking for. Right. And luckily growing up in the factories and knowing what reports are BS or reports aren't, et cetera, helps with that. Um, so yeah, we, that's a huge request. That's why a lot of companies come to us is like, it's not more than just like, Hey, we need this X product, we need X product and we need to make sure it's sustainable, et cetera. Like we can't just go on Alibaba and really necessarily do that. So that's, you know, definitely a, a big aspect of like, you know, how we can work. And then the other aspect from a sustainability standpoint, um, is it's a, a big issue is not necessarily in the promo space this is a little controversial it's i i don't think that it's a huge benefit from a sustainability standpoint when we're talking about you know this bag is made out of polyester and this bag is 100 percent hemp um what really matters is is that person going to keep the bag because you could have um literally a bag made out of straight fossil fuels right and like the but if someone keeps it for 10 years and they use it consistently and it's their main bag, it's way more sustainable than those hundred bags that made out of hemp that someone used two times and it was ugly and it was, it ripped and now it's in the landfill. Yeah, yeah I guess that's that, an interesting point. 
Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Um, you know, it it's like the the cheap product that you're given at the convention that just goes in the garbage as you're walking out the next, you know, next garbage can you see, you just throw it away. If you get a product that is actually usable and someone will will find it usable and keep it for the 10 years, like you say, that right there um, is a big difference in compared to just the, the disposables or the throwaways. Um, and, and I like that. Uh, so going after the quality products versus the cheap seems just to be the right move. Yeah. I mean, I guess at least the hemp bags are compostable or uh, yeah, compostable. So, I mean, at least, you know, if they're going to be thrown away, at least they're going to break down, you know, versus the other ones. But I think it is a, an amazing point to, you know, to consider is that, you know, you really should be striving for something that people want to keep. Right. I mean, ultimately from your business's standpoint or, you know, really, you know, the whole reason for corporate giving is, is not just because we're nice guys and we want to give, but we want you to remember our brand and we want you to think about us when it's time for you to make a purchasing decision and that sort of thing. And if, you know, like Mike's point, you know, if, if I gave you a stress ball and, and you literally bounce it off the, the window into the garbage can on your way out, like, you know, not very memorable experience, you know, you're certainly not going to remember the, uh, the squishy little ball we gave you. But, well, um, Ryan, uh, just an example right here. Do you still have the boxes to your IMAX and your iPads? The, yeah, the keep packaging. all that junk. <laughs> that right there is the difference. You know, like if you get a, a box for a, a cheap little tablet for your kid, you're not going to have, you're going to throw it away and keep the tablet. Whereas you you buy a nice laptop, it's three grand and it's a, a very well built together box that comes with it. I have four of them sitting on the counter still. And it's, it's just, you know, you, you keep it because it's a nice product. Same. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, so much of it has to do with that perception, right? I mean, I have a stack of iPhone boxes around here. So it's like for generations old phones, you know, that I don't even have the phone anymore, but I still have the box laying around. Yeah. So uh yeah, no, I, I won't say it out loud. So my wife hears that, but you know, there's still boxes <laughs> everywhere. And so, but it's a great point, right? There's a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, that you receive as a promotional item or whatever. But if it has this extra value to it, you know, either because it's on a quality product or because it's thoughtful or interesting or whatever, like people keep stuff for a lot of different reasons. But it's, uh, I think, a really good point or something to consider anyway. So um, we're kind of getting to that time. You want to tell people where they can get in touch with you, how they can find out more about your company and uh, potentially reach out if they're looking for some merch? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so we're Imprint Genius, ImprintGenius.com. Um, if you are interested in, you know, kind of following, making lots of content, teaching people about how to source products, how to vet factories, how to kind of do this yourself, if you're interested in that as well, uh, it's the sourcingguy.com where I post most of that content or at the sourcing guy on TikTok. But um, yeah, would love to help any of the audience members can definitely do some kind of promotion for if anyone says they're from coming from the podcast, give you guys, you know, hundreds of dollars off your first order. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Me. Thanks. Um, I wanted to just ask, I, I hate doing this after you've already given your, your plugs because it kind of screws up the cadence here. But I wanted to ask you one more thing. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned integration with like CRMs and things like that, but could you do, um, I mean, do you guys integrate with like, Shopify, things like that, you know, like how easy is it for me to actually get into the pipeline and using your products? Yeah. So, um, so our app integrates with Shopify and we have a Shopify app, but it's a, it's private. So what we do is we build a lot when we're building a, a storefront for a company, we build it on Shopify for the brand. Uh, and then we manage it and we kind of do the A to Z and then our app is integrated into the back end. So you get like the Shopify user experience um, with our supply chain in the back end. We have certain customers where it makes sense where we're integrating with their store, but for the most part, we really try to offer like a turnkey solution for these bigger companies that don't want to manage their own stores. Is there a significant yeah. setup fee for that? Uh, no, uh, mm -hmm. we, we we charge when we, when we build out stores, like a, a basic store without a ton of integrations, we charge about 500 bucks a month and that and that we built that's that's kind of like what our store cost looks like um and our setup cost is 500 dollars. so we do the 500 dollars for the first month we build it within that month and then you have a subscription fee after that okay cool at least, at the, time, yeah, at least at the time of this recording that's what we charge <laughs> <laughs> cool
cool. All right. Well, for people who, uh, you know, got bumped by my interrupting of the plugs, you know, once again, that's imprintgenius.com is where you go for the main business. Also, if you want to learn anything about doing some of this on your own, uh, you can learn direct from the source at sourcingguy.com. And uh, yeah, man, thanks so much for doing this, Isaac. We appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes in the show this week and every week. See you guys next